Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, it's, it's great to see some, some familiar faces here in the audience. Um, and thank you to our uh, viewers online for joining us online. And I also saw quite a few familiar names on the, on the list of those um, who are online. Um, so my, my role, what I'd like to do over the next hour is just share with you some thoughts and insights about, about entrepreneurship. And this is a very exciting topic. We're all excited about entrepreneurship uh, because of what it can create. It, it, it is a force. It's a, you know, finding new ways of creating value, rejuvenating organizations, or, or changing our lives, if you, if, you, if you speak more broadly. So it's a very exciting um, area with which we want to engage. We want the benefits of entrepreneurship. Uh, but of course, when we, before we do that, before we engage with that, there are lots of questions uh, that are useful. It's useful to ask before we uh, engage with what will turn out to be a messy, often very frustrating, often very much dead-end reaching, and yet it could be ultimately uh, very much an exhilarating process. And, and hopefully these are questions that we, we, we can ask at the beginning as we go into it. These are questions that then will help us if we're in the messiness, if we're, if we're stuck, help us remind us you know, what this, this whole entrepreneurial thing is, is, is all about. Um, so if you're excited about entrepreneurship, if you, you may have come here looking for some answers, the good news is I hope to leave you with more questions than you came, from, uh, than you came with. Okay, so that's, that's, that's part of this. The second thing to, 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 to perhaps mention here is that um, I view entrepreneurship in a, in, a very, in a very general sense. Entrepreneurship is a process, uh, engage, and this is a process that we can engage in whether we want to start our own business. This, this is the startup space. It's a process we can employ within organizations to find new ways of doing things and to deliver, rec identify, and pursue new opportunities. It's a process we can engage with if we want to make social impact, which is the whole social entrepreneurial space. It's a process in which you can engage if we're a family business looking to rejuvenate and, and, and expand, reinvigorate the business. So these are all different contexts in which, in which entrepreneurship applies. Now, who would be the one asking these questions? Again, you can wear many different hats if you, if you ask or think about these questions of entrepreneurship. You could be the entrepreneur yourself asking those questions. It could be someone who will want to, want to enable or promote entrepreneurship within, within an organization. So the questions are useful in terms of knowing, one, how does an entrepreneur think? What, is an, what, is a, what does an entrepreneurial mindset look like? And equally, if you put that mindset in a particular context, is that context actually enabling for that mindset to thrive? Because we have a combination of a person and a context in, in, in creating this. So many different hats that could, be, that could be worn here. So regardless of the hat that you wear, and I hope, hopefully I'll have something, something for you to engage with and something uh, for you to come up with uh, more questions uh, at the end. So I'll take as a starting point um, of, of an entrepreneurial journey is we all start with an, uh, with an idea. Often, you know, I have this great idea. Um, I don't want to share it with you because I'm afraid you're going to steal it because the idea is so valuable and that you know, it's, going to, it's going to change the world. So the idea is often the starting point. With the idea often comes this question, what, is that idea an opportunity? Okay, these are, these are actually quite slightly different. Is my idea an opportunity or is it, is it the case if I, if I try and run after the idea for a little bit, I quickly start to discover that maybe not as shiny uh, as, as it looks like. So how would you, how would you try and answer that question? We all have ideas. Are these ideas opportunities? Has somebody done it already? Has somebody, somebody else done it already? Yeah, this could be this could be uh, this could be a sign that this is an opportunity. You've done it done it successfully. It could have been tried by many others who have failed. Does that send a single that it's probably not worth doing, or maybe we're going to do it better? But still, this doesn't doesn't quite doesn't quite preclude it. Any other? Yeah, Any other? So we can do we can do research. Uh, and look, look for answers there, look at, look at statistics. Uh, but the point is that they are, they, are, they are slightly different things. Idea is a starting point, an opportunity is almost an end point. We almost know that something is an opportunity. We know it for sure when you know it works. And it, we know it works when it's been done and it's been shown it works. Up until then, there's always, you know, it's always a possibility, there's always a, there's a, a, a chance that it doesn't. So we can, we can think of these, um, we can start thinking about this in terms of what is an opportunity? You know, is it a thing? 
is, it, is an idea? How is that different from an idea? If we try and build one from scratch, perhaps this is what an opportunity would look like. You know? We have to have something tangible. We're talking about this is an economic process, so we have to have a, a product or a service. We have to have people who would be, who would be engaged, who would be consuming, using, finding value for that. And we need to have the facilities, the infrastructure, whether it's people, technology, or, or other facilities, to put that into, in, in, in place. It, but it's not the standalone things, it's actually the relationships between them. So a product and a person, this is a person, the person becomes a customer only when they use and find value in that product. So customer already is a relational term. This is a person or this is a piece of technology, it becomes a factor of production when it's related to what it produces. So we have a set of relationships rather than a set of, it's the relationships rather than the things. And we need the person the team, the organization who puts all these relationships in place. And that would be the entrepreneur, uh, and, and I speak here generically, whether it's a person, a team, or, or an organization. So an opportunity is ultimately a social structure. So in the same way as we have physical structures, as in, as in buildings, we have physical stru uh, social structures that are made up of things, and they, they perform cer uh, certain um, function in the way they work together. A physical structure, we put together brick by brick, and in a similar way, we put together a social structure, uh, almost uh, brick by brick as well, uh, element by element by uh, element. So we have a process whereby we go from here, these are the standalone things that exist, to weaving them together in, in, the, in, in the structure. Okay, so, so that's what the, the process is about, putting that structure together, starting from an idea, our idea of a structure, in the same way we have a blueprint and a plan for a building, to the actual building being, being put together. And now the issue is that at the beginning, this is just an idea. Okay, so here is that same structure, which at the start, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a blueprint, there's a, that this, this exists in our heads. How do we get this out of our heads into actually trying to build it for real? And this is what, this is what the journey is about. Now, another way to, to, to think about the journey would be to um, think of the idea and opportunity as separated in time. And they are, and this is, what, this is what the journey. What lies in between is this very familiar curve, uh, which also, given its shape, signifies, we call it the valley of death, you know, which is this, this bit here. And the curve, it, it just signifies that we, we have to we have to slide down and spend money first before things turn around and we end up, we end up making money if the opportunity is to, is to work out. And that valley of debt is a, very, is, a very, uh, is a very interesting thing. Many enter, few emerge. So we know that, we know that as, a, as, a, as an overall sense. And now when we think about the valley of debt and what would it take to cross it, this is the image that is the most typical. Okay, so the value that many fall through, and we have this idea of the entrepreneur who, who walks across the valley without, without falling. Now, if, you, if you've seen the, uh, the Indiana Jones movie, where this is a reference to this, which was the leap of faith, it was all about, you know, the, the bridge opens to those who believe. Uh, in this case, you would think the bridge, the bridge opens, bridge across the valley opens to those who have the right vision, whether it's uh, or whether they have the stamina, whether they have the skills, some kind of personal quality that are inaccessible to others. So we tend to, we tend to glorify uh, entrepreneurs. So we have a great person theory of entrepreneurship, which is, which is often the perceived wisdom. We either have it or we, we, we don't. And against an image like that, we often ask ourselves the question, well, is my idea you know, am I the one who able to cross the, given my idea, is my idea a good one? Am I, am I ready to cross the valley? And I often would shy away from that and think maybe this is, this is not for me, um, if, if this is what we subscribe to. So here is another way of, of uh, thinking about the, the entrepreneurial journey. And it's simply, if you take a, a, a more, a, a broader a portfolio, if you wish, if you approach, the reality is that there are many ideas that are taken forward. If you look at the baseline of, of entrepreneurial um, efforts, millions of people, as we speak, are in the process of starting a business. 
Um, so so we, we, know, we know these are facts. So there are lots of efforts that go through. Uh, and very, very few efforts who emerge at the, at the other end as, as you know, the, the big companies, the big entrepreneurial successes. Some of them become the stars. Uh, and this is you know, in a way of changing, changing the world. So some of the, what we know as facts, some of the benefits that, that entrepreneurship delivers, whether it's uh, jobs created, whether it's new value created, we know that the majority of these are created by a very handful of, of entrepreneurial companies or entrepreneurial efforts. There's often a term used, six percenters. You know, six percent of companies out there, six percent of startups, six percent of new initiatives would deliver almost, almost all the value when it comes to new jobs and new value. Okay, so we know that out of all these efforts, about six percent would be the ones who end up here. Okay, and if we know this, the logical thing would be, well, it's easy. All we have to do is identify who these 6% are, identify it here at this stage, and then we support those and don't worry about the rest. And the, three, the, the, the interesting bit is that they actually look the same. When they start, they look, they look the same. So the question is, how do you get from here to here, and what does the journey look like? Is that, is that a straight line? Is that a predetermined line that once we identify with these high potential ones, and it's a given that they're going to end up uh, delivering delivering the value. Is it is it about something something different? So one way to think about the entrepreneurial journey, one you can have a path. If I show you this, now what do you think? Well, this can represent many things, uh, but this is a, a, a crude attempt to represent the journey in terms of all the possible things that could happen in every step of the way. If we were to start, we were to start somewhere here, we could end up, you know, in any of these, end up think of any of these paths and end up in a different place. Now, what determines what happens along the way? Well, lots of, lots of, um, we could call it chance. We could call it okay, the, the, the simple, the simple case of having a socially complex, we're operating in a socially complex world, means that very often things that we expect happening would, would not be there. You make a sales call, turns out the, the person has gone on holiday not going to be back for two weeks. By the time they come back two weeks, something's happened in your company, your attention's been taken away. Very often, small things create these um, unanticipated effects. So if this is a set of the, all the possible things that could happen, when we look at a successful entrepreneurial journey, it often looks like this. You know, this is, this is when someone tells us their entrepreneurial story. They tell us, you know, all the twists and turns of the, of the story. And one of the things that we, we were, perhaps it's useful to pay attention to this. At every point of the way, there are other things that could have happened. But the things that did happen is the one that they, that they too tell us about. So we have, out of this messiness of all the possible pathways that we can find when we go, go forward, the one that has emerged, in this case, is the one that's been successful simply because we recreate that path by knowing that this is, yes, this is a successful endeavor. So all we have to do is we trace it backwards. And when we trace it backwards, this path becomes very clear. So when we look at backwards, we never think about the things that could have happened, but it didn't. We only know about the things that did happen. And so backwards, it looks very clear, it looks very inevitable, it looks very um, straightforward. Uh, but if you're sitting here without knowing what the path is going to be, all of a sudden you feel paralyzed. But well, there's so many things that could happen. Very, very hard to, to grasp all these together. So when we know that the journey has been successful, this is what it looks like. In retrospect, it's very clear. It's inevitable. It feels like this person just, just put that missing piece on the puzzle. And that this is what it's all about. And that clarity... That clarity that we get when we look at the story in, in retrospect is the same kind of clarity that we would expect if I were to take then my own idea and say, I want to see if that idea is going to work. When I want to look forward, I'm expecting to see the same level of clarity. And when I do look forward, I see this. So in prospect, it's very opaque. We don't know. it. We, we can't really, very, very difficult to think more than a few steps uh, of the way going forward. So how do we reconcile these, uh, these two things? We fail to appreciate the twists and turns of an entrepreneurial journey. And when these twists and turns are in front of us, um, you know, we're looking for ways to, to engage with that. 
So this is where this is where the questions come in. This is where the the idea of an entrepreneurial mindset. So what are the ways in which we we could think about entrepreneurship to help us go through this um, open-ended open-ended journey? So I'm going to talk about briefly about these these four things. One is a question about the future. How do we think about the future? The question about a frame, and this is about how do we frame the problems that we that we face. The question about flow, which is what process do we follow? What is the nature of the process? And the final one is the question um, around funding, which or, or, or resource. How do we support this? Most importantly, um, often in terms of in terms of funding, how do we how do we fund fund our efforts? So I'm going to go through all these uh, in order. Talk about briefly about each of them, and then hopefully have some conversation. Any any thoughts? Yes. Yeah, okay. Surely the whole of that is encapsulated in time. Time is a critical factor. Okay, yes. So when we, when we talk about all of these, time becomes an essential, essential element uh, of that. So I would encapsulate okay. it in time. Okay. Good. Um, I, I may, may have reached the limits of my drawing abilities in terms of, in terms of portraying <laughs> this, right. this here. The yes. The time at the bottom, yes. So there, there's a question of, of time as well. So um, time is very much present in what 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 what's coming, and yeah, what I'd like to talk about. To market, you're tr you've yeah. got competition on your tail. You need to know that you can beat the competition into the market and produce the product. Yeah. Agree. Point was about competition, anticipating how this is where social complexity comes in. Doing things sometimes without knowing what others have planned, what others are doing at the same at the, at the same time. So let me, uh, let me talk about these. Uh, so the question about the future has to do with what is the way in which we think about the future? How do we think about the future? And that, that also determines what is the way, then, given the way we think about the future, how do we approach it? What is, what is our baseline predisposition, if you wish, towards approaching it? Now, these are interesting questions to ask because often we don't think about this. And then we do things because this feels the ways they should be done. But if we try and inquire a little bit deeper into that, it, it will turn out that at the basis of that lies some fundamental assumption about what the future is. And so all of a sudden, if we start questioning that, it, it, opens, up, it opens up a few more, few more possibilities. Now, we worry about the future in, um, you know, because of these things. We want to know what will happen, what are the events that will happen, but the events by themselves are not... Um, are not meaningful. Events are not meaningful. If you, if you sit on the train, go on a train to London, sit down, and someone is sitting next to you, and you, you strike a conversation with them. We, we strike conversation with people we don't know all the time. So this in itself would not be a meaningful event. What will become a meaningful event, if it turns out that by the end of that conversation, you find a lot in common, you decide to start a business together, and that business becomes very successful, and then later on when you tell the story and you said, can you, can you imagine it was all down on meeting that person on the train to London? Can you think that I could have gone and sat in the car in the next car or I could have said a few rows up and actually never met that person? So the mere meeting of the person is not significant. What's significant is the consequences of that and, and ultimately and how that changes preferences in trying, trying to anticipate uh, what, what people would do. So, when we, when we talk about events, this is often about prediction, trying to predict what events will happen. When we talk about consequences, this is about prophecy. And what are the consequences of the event? Prophecy, as you would perhaps agree, this is a bit more difficult to, to venture into the area of prophecy. Uh, even more difficult is to expect, to anticipate how, we'll, how we will feel about things, let alone how others will feel about things. And this is where, you know, Henry Ford's... Um, Inside was quite, quite interesting. He said, if I had asked what people wanted, they would have said faster horses. <laughs> and the thing here is that people did probably want faster horses. If you had asked them about cars, they could not react. They could not give you an answer about cars. If you put a car in front of them, all of a sudden, the way, with, the, the way they feel and, and their preferences would change simply in reaction to putting them in a car or in a car in front of them. Prior to that, it's difficult to know how they would feel at something that exists in the abstract. So these are very, very, very precarious uh, categories. There's, there's nothing firm in, in terms of looking, looking ahead. There's nothing firm to anchor on 
uh, when we think about these. So they lead us to thinking about, you know, trying to position um, or trying to define the way we feel define the future. And we can do this in two ways. Do we think about the future as something, something that is outside of us? And when it's outside of us, it's something that we have to try and define, try and predict, try and analyze, try and research. So we find out what it is. And once we know what it is, we, we take the right position. So is the future outside of us or are we inside the future? In the sense that the future, it, it, it doesn't really exist. It's what we do affects what others do. And we're affected what what others do. And our actions affect the actions of others. The actions of others affect our actions. So this collectively makes the future emerge. But it doesn't really, it doesn't really pre-exist as a thing that we can, we can position ourselves against. Now, this is often, this is often um, a very dominant way of, of, of looking at the future. So this, you know, all this, all this um, efforts around, all we need to do is try harder to predict better. And once we have a prediction, then we can align ourselves according to that prediction if we made the right prediction. Or we try to move faster to adapt better. So this is the idea that we don't know what the future is, but what we want to do is always follow a step behind. So whatever happens, we align ourselves to that. So these are two, the two, two approaches that signify different ways of trying to position ourselves against, against the future. This belief here is, is then related to a fundamental belief about how is it that the future happens? How does it come about? Is that something that happens out of necessity? Is, it, is there a law-like deterministic relationship between, you know, this is a high potential thing now and, and it's, it's just a matter of, matter of course, a matter of time before this materializes as something successful because we've identified it as high potential? Or is success is what happens as a matter of contingency. Contingency being things that um, arise, new things that happen every step of the way, and they dictate, they inform, and they change the choices that we make down the line. So this is a step-by-step. -step. Does the future happen a step-by-step? -step? Does the future happen in a predetermined way? Now, they, these are then interesting, this, this predisposition that we have, because then we look at the future, or this leads to two different, two different statements that we can make about the future. One statement we can make is, I am uncertain about the future. And what lies behind that statement is that it's a matter of missing information. The future is something out there. It also matter, it's all a matter of my finding that missing information, so I will fill in the blanks that I feel. Uh, in, 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 there's gaps in my knowledge, I'd like to fill them. And when I fill them, I will feel very comfortable, I have a sense of what the future is. I position myself against it. Okay, so that's one. The second one is to make the statement that the future itself is uncertain. And so out of principle, you would say that it doesn't really exist until it does, until it, until it comes about. And, it, and in this sense, it's fundamentally unknowable. Because there's, there's always a range of possibilities, but which one, similar to what I, I showed there, it's a range of possibilities. Which one of these happens? You can't really predetermine. You can't really set. You said that, well, this is going to be the, the path, the possibility it's going to happen. So you have to be, you have to be nimble. You have to be contingent. You have to respond to what happens, as opposed to put all your efforts on anticipating and then locking yourself, locking yourself in. So these are two different positions that we that we can take. If, if, if it's a question about my being uncertain about the future and trying to, trying to gather all the information uh, possible to put there, and what this leads to is that this, this sense that there's a right and wrong way in, in terms of acting or stepping forward. So it leads us to make judgments about what is the appropriate thing to do. And what a judgment is, effectively a drawing a line in the sand is saying, okay, well, that my judgment defines a border between what is what we consider to be true and what we consider to be false or error. So we look at an idea, if it falls in this region here, we take this as true, we can, we can act. If it follows outside, it's, it's false. Now, the interesting thing about this idea of applying your judgment 
is that judgment is based on what we know. And this, this line here is, is actually very tentative. It's something that is very arbitrary. Because if we know a little bit more, we'll draw a different line. And if we put too much faith into making the right judgment, then you know, this, this, we're setting ourselves up for some uh, potentially negative, negative surprises. So a good example of a, of a person who made the judgment, and you know, we can look backwards and say whether this was good or bad judgment, would be, um, well, is little known, but recently uh, revisited by the BBC, one of the co-founders of Apple, um, Original, one of the original, original co-founders, um, Ron Wayne. Ron Wayne was a co-founder of Apple together with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. He's the one who drew the partnership agreement for Apple, and he had 10% of the company. It was split 45, 45, 10. So Apple was incorporated, and he was the driving force behind the incorporation. And a week later, he wanted out. A week later, he wanted out. He was bought out, 10% of Apple. He, he sold this, he sold this. He was bought out by, by Jobs and Wozniak for $800. His judgment was to, to step out and to you know, forego 10% of, of Apple for $800. Now, he made a very, very solid judgment. And the solid judgment was to deliver their first order that they received, they had to borrow $15,000 from the bank. Uh, even though this was incorporation, there was, there was, there was some, some personal liability. The, the details are known, but obviously there's some personal liability behind the, behind the loan. And he had, heard, he had heard that the shop that placed the order was very unreliable in paying their bills. He made the judgment. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they, don't know, they have no assets. I, on the other hand, I have a house and a car and a lot of other things. If the bank were to go after us, they're not going to go after them. They're going to go after me. He made a very sound judgment to, to step out. Now, you can say, you know, this was foolish. You know, from the position, from the benefit of hindsight, we can say this was, this was a foolish judgment. Well, the interesting thing is that he wasn't alone. Hewlett Packard declined twice, once to invest, once, when asked whether they wanted to claim legal copyright on what Apple was created, they issued an official document that said, no, we don't want to pay any claims to that. Commodore refused to invest, uh, Atari as well, as well as the venture capital backer, Don Valentine, the first time around when he was asked. Um, so Ron Wayne's judgment was actually a good judgment, and it was supported, corroborated by the, by the judgments of others. So what is the problem here? The problem is not that he made a bad judgment. The problem is that he made a judgment at all, in a way. So judgment was what, what, was, what was getting in the way. So one way to think about judgment in this case, especially when we try to exercise a judgment about the future, you know, another way of saying predictions are difficult, especially when they're about the future, you know, to, to paraphrase a saying, is that this is what we're operating in. Judgment comes from what we know, and what we know is in the way you know, if we lose it, define it into these areas. Now, these are the known knowns. These are the things we know we know. They're the known unknowns, things we know we don't know. They're unknown knowns, things we don't know that they're known. And of course, they're the unknown unknowns, things that we don't know that we don't know. Okay, so when we exercise judgment, when we try to, try to draw the line in the sand, we operate here. Uh, if we do a little bit more research, we'll try to get into that illuminated area, capture a little bit of the known unknowns, as well as if we talk to other people, get a little of the unknown knowns. But there's a limit to how much we can stretch it. The unknown unknowns, which is that dark territories, is all these contingencies that are lurking in the dark in a way that they get invited when you do something. When you do something in this social, socially interconnected system, you do something, it affects the, the actions and, and the preferences and behaviors of others, and that triggers some of those unknown unknowns to come forward. Okay, so in a way, once you, once you act, you would probably make a different judgment because you've uncovered information that all of a sudden turned to prove to be quite useful, but it's not information that you would have known before. 
So what do we do? But one way to think about this is that we have to see how do we balance this urge to exercise judgment. This is a bad idea. You shouldn't do this. I wouldn't do it. Um, against something else. Now, what is that something else? Now, I think we can, we can look at this very loosely as in, you know, what are the, 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 the counteract between think before you act, which is, which is this idea of, of judgment, and the other one is act before you think, which is probably the best way to describe that is taking a chance. Okay, taking a chance. So anytime when we do stuff without knowing exactly why we're doing it, and without a full anticipation of what may happen, this is in effect taking a chance. Now, so in entrepreneurship in many ways is taking a chance. Okay, you can take that idea, you can, you can unpack it. You know, how do we take chances? So there's lots of other questions that emerge out of that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a chance with everything that I have. I wouldn't throw that, you know, taking a chance with, you know, one single, one single venture, one single idea. That would, be, that would be foolish. But there are different ways of taking a chance as a way of kind of releasing, gathering more, more information that, that, that enables us to act, to act further. So that's the, you know, the question of what is the future and, and how to face it. It ultimately comes down to taking a chance, in, in often in very small ways. And a lot of the stories, a lot of the success stories that we have is there is a sense that a chance is being taken. Now, a chance comes, comes very close with luck. And a lot of the stories that we hear, people appreciate. They would say that I was fortunate. It turned out to be a lucky move to this and that. Luck very much features in an entrepreneurial story. And it's simply the idea that when you take a chance, and it actually, things turn out quite, quite well. So this, this opens up new possibility. This is, this is the fortunate bit. But you can't really anticipate that until you do take the chance. Now, this takes us to having dealt with the future, it takes us to the question of frame. The frame has to do is when you look forward in terms of trying to figure out what to do, uh, a good way to describe this is we try and solve problems. We want to try to deal with the things that we think is, you know, what, what, what we're facing, deal with that. Now, what are the problems, what do these problems um, look like? And how do, we, how do we approach them? Now, I mentioned the word social complexity already, but this is, you know, when we operate it in this, in this our economic environment is very much an environment of inter, interconnectivity, right? What we do affects what others do, they in effect affect what others do. So when everything is inter interconnected, one small action in one part of can have, can have quite significant consequences um, um, around. This would be the equivalent of, um, jumping on an inflatable bouncy castle, if you ever tried doing that. You're trying to jump on the castle with everybody else is jumping around you. What happens is that you cannot fully anticipate, you cannot really time your jumps, you, can, you want to be fully in control, but it turns out that this is all, um, uh, uh, looks a bit chaotic, but there's actually a lot of, you know, what, what it ultimately is an expression of this interconnectivity. So which simply means we can't really, very difficult to think more than a few steps ahead. In terms, of, in terms of consequences, uh, in terms of what, what will happen. So we, all we often do is, yes, you take a chance, you take one step, and then you revisit where you are and where you go next. So this is always this step-by-step step step, um, approach. When it comes to, when you, when you connect this to problems, it turns out that every time we deal with problems that are in this socially complex place, these problems are not straightforward. They're not structured. They're not problems, they have a clear structure, a clear solution, and it's something that you can do over and over and over and always get to the right answer. Turns out that there are special type of problems uh, that are known as ill-structured, the wicked, wicked problems. And what is interesting about uh, these type of problems is that they have multiple framings. Multiple framing simply means you have an idea, you have a, you have a, you have a business say that it is not doing well, you're looking for new opportunities. Depending on who looks at it, you would see the problems in different way. The HR person would see it as an HR problem, marketing person would see that's a marketing problem, the finance person would say this, you have a problem with financial control, um, and, and the operational person would say, you know, we have problems in our, in our operations. So there are different ways to look at the problem. And there's no, not every, they're all right. You cannot say that this is the wrong way of looking at it. 
The other one is that the problem is often, you cannot formulate a problem until you propose a solution. And we, we don't know, we don't know, in other words, we don't know what the problem is until, until we put a solution in front. That's the beauty of a solution. So if I, if I wanted a solution, I don't know, uh, a table to put something on, something to be, uh, and you say, here is a table, here's a very generic one. I would say, but this is nice, but I don't like the style, I don't like the color, I don't like the material, I don't like the feel of it. And all of a sudden, what started out is a simply, I want something to put my things on, all of a sudden it popped out that there's such things as style, color, material, and everything else. That you, we didn't know it existed until, until I engaged with the, with the, with the solution. And this is what often happens when we make a prototype, you put it in front of, you, 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 you thought it was solving one problem, you put it in front of a customer and they said, okay, this is nice, but it'd be nice to have all these other things. Because all of a sudden, now that you've, now that you've created this, I can think of all these other ways that will be, be great to have. So then the solution drives the formulation. So you can't really have a problem first and the solution second, which is what a structured problem is. Then everyone is no, every problem is novel and unique because of the different context, because so we try to, so there's a limited way in which we can export solutions from one area to another. There's no stopping rule in the sense that there never comes a point where you say the problem is solved. It can always go on. And so that's another, another gem. When do, you, when, do you actually, when do you actually stop? Related to that is that solutions are not right or wrong because of all that, uh, the, the context in which these, these problems are. The solutions are not right or wrong, but they can be good or bad. You can make a solution, propose one, make a prototype, d depending on, on the way in which people react to it, it can be good or bad in terms of, in terms of how they feel. So they're not right or wrong, but good or bad. And we use that evaluation, whether they're good or bad, to inform what we do, what we do next. Now, this is a very interesting thing about problems like this, especially when they operate in this socially complex place, is that they're, um, all the solutions are one-shot. They're one-shot solutions, which means if you try something and if it doesn't work, unlike playing a computer game where a game over and you reset the game and you do it again, you know how to do it better, there's no reset button here. So when you do something and it doesn't work out, you can never go back to where you were and try something different. When if something doesn't work out, all of a sudden all you have on your hand is your previous problem plus the new problem that you've created with the solution that you've proposed. So you have to, there's only one direction in which you can move and this is, and this is forward. There's no stepping back and say, oh, I'm gonna try this again. And finally, uh, you know, the number of potential solutions are unbounded, which simply means that there is never a point in which you create a need boundary and say, these are my solutions, and all I have to do is choose the best one. So it's very difficult to optimize when we deal with something that is, that is unbounded. So what do we do when we, when we have problems like this? Well, we have to revisit the way we approach problem solving. One is we often, we often make the assumption in, in whether it's within organizations, whether it's you know, in trying to decide what to do as a business, we make the assumptions it's actually easy to come up with alternatives and the difficult thing to do is how do you choose between them or among them. So, so we, we try to put our emphasis on choice. You know, what's the, what's the right thing, what's the right thing to do? Uh, whereas the opposite way, given, given that we're dealing with problems that are wicked, you know, they're not structured, they're, 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 they're very iterative in the way we deal with them, the term is to think that actually choice is easy once you have a good alternative. If you design something that works, why do you need more alternative? If, it, if that's where it works, this is where you stop. It's easy, it's, easy to choose, it's easy to choose this. So the focus is on designing, making things that work, as opposed to you know, aligning a set of alternatives and then try, trying to exercise which one of these, which one should we, should we, should we choose. Now, often the problem with, um, with aligning alternatives is, is that there, there's, a, there's a little bit of language, there's a language game involved when we talk about alternative solutions. It's a bit like saying all we have to design, all we have to do is design a product that delivers X. 
the, the, the product, the something that people want. Okay, you say that's actually an easy thing. We'll go for that alternative. We'll design it. But we don't know what it looks like, what this looks like. We don't know what people want until they want it, actually. They, 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 until we show that we can, they can want it. Uh, okay, this, this, this agreement, right? I'll give you an option. Okay, okay. That came out of the Vietnam War. But, um, I think it was Johnson & Johnson. Okay. Came up with the super glue, with the idea that the soldiers who arrived at MASH hospitals, those who were badly wounded, mm -hmm. they could then solve the problem, particularly those with fractured, well, Livers that were split open and all over the place, and some of them kidneys. They invented a super glue with the idea that the surgeon would just come in and just spray and put everything back together and off he went. Mm -hmm. But they could not get the product past the FDA, Federal Drug Administration, for approval. So they then turned the product into a super glue mm. that was then used for repairing glass or whatever. Okay. So a good, good example of, of constraints under which, under which sometimes we, we these, these are constraints. In this, in this, in this case, FA, FDA approval is an example of, of one of the constraints with which we have to, we have to work. So in this case, that makes the, the problem unworkable in, as originally intended. Problem. Yes. The initial problem was solvable from the military point of view, mm. but from the point of view of being able to use it within hospitals within the United States, it was not yeah. possible. Okay, and, and actually the, 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 gen, the general point here, and it's one of the things that we do know, is that we, when we deal with, with uh, inventions and things that we, you know, we, we put together to solve a particular problem, where they end up in the, in the marketplace is always not the original use that was intended. Uh, in this case, this was because of regulatory constraints. In other cases, it's because of, because of the way, the, way the, the, uh, the, the market process is, is worked out. It was not quite the case in the original use. There was no appetite for it. But in the process of exploring it, a different, a different use has emerged. So in this case, the Viagra would be the example of, a, of an unintended, unintended use. It was intended for one thing, turned out to, to find application in a completely, in a completely different, uh, different area. Uh, but then, you know, this is back to the question of designing a good solution. Uh, under under a set of under a set of constraints, rather than rather than pre-committing to to one one particular uh, area. Now, so the way the way we think about design problems or or responding and solving solving um, the kind of problems I've been talking about, wicked wicked problems, is we take an approach where we want to achieve an outcome, but there are different ways. And we can try and put this, this together. This is, this is the unstructured nature of, of the program. So if you take these two circles to, to represent, in loose sense, a combination of what and how, what plus how gives us, gives us an outcome, it's pretty open-ended, the hows that we explore, and then the what that comes with each, the, the, in terms of the combinations that we, that we use. Often with structured problems, we kind of lock ourselves in and say, okay, this is... So we're going to use a different, particular process, particular how. All we all we need to do is find the what. Or we we start with the what. These are the things with our disposal, and we all this we have to work only with them, trying to get to that particular outcome. This this is telling you that as a as a as a as a way of approaching a problem, is very much liquid and 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 open, in terms of the different framings that we can um, we can apply. So this this then gives us a sense of what the design problem is that an entrepreneur faces. Whether, again, whether this is something that they're doing on their own or whether within an organization. It's a problem that is intertwined, cons consists of three different sub-problems, if you wish. It needs to be, we need to solve the sub-problem of market desirability. It needs to be something that is wanted, someone needs to want. And there's a problem of technical or operational feasibility. We need to be able to put this together, deliver to a sufficient level of quality. And ultimately, we have a problem of financial viability, which is however we do this, it needs to be financially viable. So the idea, the idea behind this being a uh, ill-structured or wicked problem is that when we try to solve any of these problems and we think we've solved it, a problem pops up in another area. 
So we go and define exactly what people want, only to find out that you can't really produce it to the level of quality that they want. Or if you can produce it and you tally everything together, you realize that this, the whole thing does, wouldn't really be financially viable. So they have to go back to the drawing board. And this is, he continuously bounce off any of these three uh, problems. And the question is, how do we find ultimately a sweet spot that, that solves, solves all three problems uh, together? Which then takes us to the question of process. How do, we, how do we engage in this in terms of process? Is that the process that is very linear, prescribed, and all we have to do is, is follow the recipe? Or is it a process that is of a different, uh, different nature? So, in terms of a roadmap, yes, this is, you know, this idea of market desirability, you know, we worry about, you know, we think about this as a, some kind of a customer interface and how do we operate that. So we, that's one part of the map that we have to, we have to think about. The other part is technical, technical feasibility is all about what's the infrastructure we put in place, what operations need to be put in place for this to be delivered, who does what, how this is configured together, and we have to have a financial model to capture what, what the results of all, this, of all this exercise would be. So in terms of a map, you know, this gives us a mapping of where we need to be focusing our, uh, our attention. In terms, of, in terms of the process, the process is ultimately about reducing unknowns. So at the beginning, is this set of unknown unknowns, and lots of things we don't know in terms of whether this would work or not. And this is a process of reducing. How, how do you reduce an unknown? In a way, we have to put it in the, in the, you know, in the, the backward mirror. It has to be in the mirror. We have to see it behind it. The, one, the only way to reduce an unknown is to try to convert it into a known, whether that known is, a, is a good or bad in terms of its consequences for us. And the only way you do that is by doing something. That's back to the taking a chance uh, point, point of view. Pilot. So, so pilot is, is a way of trying things on a smaller scale using that results. It's, it's a way of converting unknowns into knowns. But where it becomes really interesting is that this is back to this idea of a one-time time solution. In the entrepreneurial process, we deal with what is effectively one-time shots. And just to, just to illustrate very briefly what that means is, imagine, you know, there's something behind one of these three doors. Something could be some kind of a payoff. Think of it as a, maybe it's 100, 100 pounds behind. Or some, 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 well, something, something good is behind one of these doors. The question is what, what approach would you take in, in, in whether you want to bet, whether you want to invest, what do you want to do? And all we have to do is open one of these three doors. The trick is that you only, do, you get, only get to do this once. And this is where the idea of probability breaks down. Okay, the idea of probability, you know, if you, if this, if you say, well, there's an equal chance that it's behind of any of these three doors, you would, you would bet an amount. But this is all predicated on the fact that if you open it, you know, 100 times, 33 times will be approximately behind this door, behind this, and behind this. So you can actually, if you get to do something over and over and over and over, this is where probability works. When it's a one-time thing, Probability doesn't really, it doesn't really help you. You open one door and it's either there or it's not. And then that's it. Because you move only forward, you have to, uh, you have to, you have to deal with that. So that's what, that's what dealing with unknown is, unknowns is. And I'll, I'll show you in a second how this plays out in the funding, in the funding space, this, this reduction of unknowns. So we then have a process. What the process is about is trying to apply in whatever we do, trying to apply, you know, looking at what happens as well as reflecting on why this could have happened and what it means, and we reflect on that at several levels. The very lowest level is, is what we've just done. You know, you do something, it either works or it doesn't. Well, immediately it tells you whether this type of action works or it doesn't. But then the action is embedded in some kind of a framing you have a framing that you're solving a particular problem for which this action was a solution. So before you make a conclusion, complete conclusion about the action, you have to think, what does this tell us about how we frame the problem? If we frame the problem in a different way, perhaps we, we, we could get a different readout. Now the action is embedded in the situation. 
uh, sorry, the, the framing is embedded in the situation. What does that tell us about the situation? Now the situation in itself is embedded in some assumptions that we've made, which have led us to choose that situation in the first place. And the assumptions, they're in turn embedded in some kind of a model we have of what we're trying to achieve. So you can see that this, this evaluation and reflection, if you do it, you can, you can successively revisit each of these. Now these are the most fundamental ones. These are the most the proximate ones when we, when we do. And so the process, the process is about being flexible enough to move through all these levels. Often the idea of, of you know, someone being persistent means, let's say we're stuck, we never move beyond this level, we never question the framing, assumptions, and other things we've done. We're trying to make this particular thing work. And this is where we're losing some of the flexibility, some of the open-endedness of, uh, of, of the process. So a good way to think of that is, is you know, this the counterbalance between finding a solution, you know, trying to make a particular thing work, versus finding a new problem. And this is a way of, of jumping off in a completely different area. Again, an example of taking a chance. And, and often that can, that, can leave, that, 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 can lead to, um, that can lead to different things. Now this jumping off is, is you know, for no particular reason, it's just try to explore a different area and see how this works, is, is interesting in the way that you know, evolution has worked for so many, yeah, for so many years. You know, the idea behind mutation is, is exactly that. Mutation is about jumping off in a different direction. It's in, you know, biological work is imperfect copying, but you can see the equivalent in this, you know, trying to explore a space. You're jumping off, there's no particular reason for it, but once you're there, it opens up new possibilities. If you had to decide whether you jump off, exercise judgment, it's difficult to justify jumping off, but once you do it, it opens up things. Uh, and, you, and, you go, and you go from there. So in terms of abilities, you know, think about what does it mean to, to, to live and, and, and thrive in this, in this process. One is we have to be able to um, recognize constraints that are self-imposed, things that we are imposing ourselves on the, on the process, in the, on the process and, and whether we can revisit these. And there is this idea of willingness to live with, with uncertainty. And we can question these at individual level, organizational level, and think whether, you know, are we, are we re really ready to tolerate these things? One is to consider alternative and conflicting ideas, just to give them consideration. Consider rather than, you know, discount some of them uh, straight out of hand. Defer judgment is a, is, a, is a very, very important one. Hanging on to a central idea, this is kind of moving across the level. Ultimately, there's an there's a overarching purpose that you're trying to, something that you're trying to achieve. But that purpose can be actually uh, embedded in lots of different things that you, you, could, you could do. The most important one, perhaps, is this idea of having faith in the process itself. If you have faith, if you're, if you're, if you're keeping the process liquid and open, now that faith means at some point, you're going to get some traction. There's no guarantee when and how this is going to happen. It's about, you know, how do you, how do you keep this going. This is, where, this is where entrepreneurship is actually quite, quite a difficult thing, if you think. Particularly if you, wanna, if, you wanna, if you want to enact this within a structure, organizational structure, that is very much about accountability and justification for what, for what we do. So the reality then, if you go back to the earlier point about crossing the valley of death, the reality is it's very difficult, very, very difficult to go through the valley. So what a lot, a lot of larger companies do, of course, is they wait at the end. They just look at the companies that have already crossed the valleys and they would happily acquire them. As a way of avoiding trying to nurture efforts in trying to get those efforts through the valley themselves because that's where it gets it's very, very difficult. Uh, and of course, if we, we can know that if we put, you know, if we send off 100 efforts through the valley, all we, all we have to do is wait at the other end because we'll know that three or four are going to come through. And all we have to do is wait for those three or four. Now, if you're one of those individual efforts, of course, it's a different question. We're going to make sure that it's you that, that goes, through, that goes through, the, through the valley. Now, the final thing I wanted to, and, and, and I want to discuss this in a very, very generic way, uh, because as I said, my goal here is to open up new questions. Uh, and this is this idea of, of funding. 
of when to finance and, and how to finance. Now, this is something I call the survival slide. In the survival slide, it comes from the simple idea that, well, one, entrepreneurship is a complex task. We have to do lots of things over time. And to succeed, all of these have to go right. To fail, only one needs to go wrong. Right? That's an interesting asymmetry between success and failure. So if you look at them like, like that, if you think about the idea that you know, if one thing goes wrong, then the whole effort is derailed. If you think about you know, how close you are to the finishing line, you have this idea that at the beginning, we all you know, we start with 100% survival. And then things are dropping off over time simply because there was that one thing that they could not get right. So we have this natural, natural survival rate, which is quite low. And if you look at you know, five years, you could be between the idea and something surviving for a number of years as a, as a venture or a business, you're going to have a very low, very low survival rate, looking at it from the, from the start to finish. Now, the opposite of that is an expected value climb. There was survival wide, and this is an exactly mirror value of the previous chart that I showed you. The climb in expected value means that simply because you've survived through those initial stages, the expected value of your effort increases simply because you've knocked a lot of the uncertainties that are, that are uh, out there. So take, you know, if you take something, five things you need to do, and they're equally likely with 80%, say, probability, the fact that they all have to go together is that the overall probability of success is only about 15%. But as soon as you eliminate, as soon as you survive through one of them, your probability jumps. And it and jumps, jumps even further. So by eliminating uncertainty, your expected value climbs. And now this is without even changing your endpoint. So with the same endpoint, simply because you're getting closer to it, it expected value increases. And that's the, that's the value of eliminating uncertainty. Another way of translating this is that you can think of this of step-ups in value. So this is a hypothetical example, but it uses, uses, uh, uses stylistic facts to derive these things. So as a, as a simple rule of thumb, and if you go through the idea stage to the stage where you're actually ready to, the business is ready to start up, you have a you have an over threefold increase in expected value simply because you've knocked up some key uncertainties out of, out of the picture. So that's the idea of reducing that uncertainty. The same thing, you have the steps as further, further down the line. But the biggest gains are, are here early on, simply because there's so many unknowns about the way that this idea uh, is going to work. And as soon as you start converting these unknowns into knowns, you have a, you have a value that goes up. Again, this is without changing the endpoint. Value goes up simply because the number of uncertainties around the idea is, is, getting, is getting reduced. So then the, this raises some interesting questions about what happens in the interaction between an entrepreneur or someone with an idea, this could be within an organization, and someone who holds the money, who has the, has the resources. Now, what is interesting about this is that if you ask entrepreneurs, you know, what is the biggest challenge that you face, they universally say lack of funding. If we had more money, you know, we make this idea work. What's even, even more interesting that if you ask investors what their biggest problem is, they say lack of good deals. So how could it be entrepreneurs lack money and, and, idea, and investors lack entrepreneurs almost? So there's, there's a way in which these two uh, don't necessarily meet all the time. And the reason they don't meet is, is you know, when we, when we look at an idea, when we look at, it, we look at the business, we can look at it in two ways. In, we can look at it in a way if everything that this could achieve, if everything went well. So this is our optimistic, this is our hopeful view. And there's another way, which is, which is we can start focusing on everything that could go wrong and all the reasons why it wouldn't work. And these are really two sides, two sides of the same coin. And sometimes we, we wear different hats. And the entrepreneur, the investors, may wear different hats in that conversation. So I wanted to use the hat analogy uh, because this links to uh, the idea of um, 
uh, De Bono is uh, uh, someone who has written about thinking a lot. He has this idea of the six thinking hats. And I've, I've picked up four of the six hats. And one of them is the yellow hat, which is the optimistic hat. And it's all about this is how this idea will change the world. This is all the benefits that this will bring. And it's a typical hat worn by an entrepreneur, the person asking for the money. The investor often wears a black hat, which is, which is the hat of reason. And this is, is it, these are all the reasons why this wouldn't work. There's a red hat, which is how do we feel about this? I feel good about the idea, I have a good hunch. There's a, we cannot deny feelings. You know, this, if, if that's the way we feel, this, this cannot be de denied. But then there's a white hat. We, we, we just ask, you know, what are the facts? What are the facts in this? So you can imagine an interaction where an entrepreneur investor wearing different hats. And this is where, this is where it, would, it would break down. So in terms of the question of when and how to fund, there's some interesting questions to consider in terms of sources of funding, timing, and amount of funding. We want to ask the question of, you know, what is the purpose of the person who provides the funding or the entity that provides the funding? Do they have a strategic purpose? Do they have a social purpose? Do they have a purely financial or economic purpose? Uh, because then that drives the way, the way they make decisions. We have to ask ourselves to what extent they operate in an environment that they have to be accountable for their decisions. So if there is an environment of accountability, for me to give money, if I have to be accountable for all the financial decisions I've made, this really ties up my hands because I have to exercise judgment, I have to be able to justify. So I cannot back things that are very optimistic, I have to look for hard evidence, I have to exercise um, that judgment, which means that I cannot really look at ideas that are too early in their, in their stage. So they just, just things are stacked up against that. The same if, you know, if you operate in an environment where decisions have to be justified. If you think about the decision you make, and if you have to justify your decision in front of someone, it changes the dynamic about how you assess and evaluate things. Simply that pressure for justification. And finally, there's the issue of what are the implications of control. We talk about entrepreneurship as a process that is very contingent. One of the things about taking advantage of that contingency is to be always able to respond to new developments if you have the flexibility to respond. But one of the ways in which that flexibility can be eliminated if someone invests and they tie your hands. They tie you up to the plan that you've, you've, you've said that you want to deliver. And when your hands are tied and new things happen and you see new directions in which you can take the business, that, you know, that flexibility is not there. So how do you, you know, you have to think about control and how do you, how do you maintain control as you try to, uh, to take things forward. So I've gone through the four areas, uh, the future frame, flow, and, and, and the funding. Hopefully I've raised many questions in your, in your, in your minds and uh, we can, I'll be happy to engage in, in, in further conversation. Be happy to be challenged, be happy to be told uh, that, that you know, everything I've said is, is wrong. Uh, so let, let's have a let's have a conversation. Thank you, thank you for your attention, and uh, yeah. What do you see the differences between the individual entrepreneur and the entrepreneur and the corporate entity? Do you see it being the same dynamic you've described, or is there any fundamental difference? Well, there, there, there. there well, quite significant difference, I suppose. The, the, the operating outside of a, of a corporate entity, which means you're not in a context that is bound by rules uh, and practices. So there's a flexibility. So you, you, you're able to be a lot more flexible when you operate outside of a corporate context. Now, that said, if the context is 